and Larry and I had been talking recently that um, in, in family medicine, there's a tremendous opportunity with some of the, the founders of the profession, folks that were there from the beginning, who um, watched the profession grow, who um, found these stories and ideas and visions of, of the early days of family medicine and then watched over the past few decades. And he and I, over the last couple of months, have been going about trying to, to have these kind of conversations with some of those folks that we consider as, as kind of paramount founders and voices for the profession. And we, we want to interview folks like yourself uh, for an opportunity to see what the dream uh, and the vision was from the start and also hope that we can take some of these, this collection of interviews and use it to reinvigorate or inspire this next generation. So for myself, as I'm stepping into the, the, the field and the profession myself, how I can share these ideas and these stories from, um, from folks like yourself. And so we've interviewed quite a lot of people, and um, we're, we're, more than anything, we just want to find a way to collect these stories and then get them out there to, to others. And so um, what we're doing tonight, we're hoping to have a chance to talk to you a little bit, if, if you were to reflect back on the pathway to, that brought you here to today. And um, would love, if you would, just for us, if you'd share briefly a little bit about your background and where you're coming from that led towards your medical school and then residency as well. Well, okay. Um, as you know, my story is a very long story. I mean, it was um, <laughs> more than 40 years ago that I started medical school. Um, but um, I grew up in in Anniston, Alabama. Um, uh, my parents had 10 children. Two of them died very early. My mother delivered all of her children at home. Up there, she didn't have a choice, really. But, um, and I became very ill at the age of two, and uh, with whooping cough and pneumonia. And uh, I guess after a lot of pleading, my parents were able to get uh, a general practitioner, family physician. The only black physician in Anniston was Doctor Jackson. And apparently, he came out to the farm, because the hospital was segregated, they didn't admit black patients. He came out to the farm to see me. And according to the story, he spent the whole day there. Uh, but uh, wow. when he got ready to leave, he told my parents that he didn't expect me to live. But he also took the time to show them what to do to give me the best chance of living. Wow. And I uh, so I survived. My parents must have listened well and did a great job. And But my mother would tell me that story every chance she got. So by the time I was five years old, the one thing I wanted to do was to meet Dr. Jackson. So they promised me that for my sixth birthday, they would take me to town to meet Dr. Jackson. So I was very excited about that. Um, Never got a chance to meet him. He he died that year of a stroke. He was fifty four years old. But by the time I was six, I was by the time I was telling everybody I was gonna be a doctor just like Dr. Jackson. And I was coming back to Anniston to take care of people. And you know, I didn't know what I was talking about, obviously, but nobody in my family had finished high school at that time. My parents neither of my parents finished elementary school. But uh, they were great parents, though, and took education very seriously. And I took it seriously because um, I knew that if I was going to be a doctor, I had to, I had to be better than most of the people in terms of academically. So to make a long story short, um, I ended up getting a scholarship to Morehouse, and they promised me that I'd always be able to get a job to pay room and board, and they kept their promise. And so I did well at Morehouse, uh, despite the fact that I missed some classes during the student sit-in movement, and um, and 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 ended up uh, attending Case Western Reserve. I had gotten involved with research at Morehouse as a part of it. It actually came from one of my jobs. One of my jobs was to work in the laboratory with Dr. Roy Hunter, and so he got me involved with his research. I got a National Science Foundation grant to spend the summer doing research at Texas Southern. And so by the time I got to medical school, I was interested in both uh, the practice of medicine and research. And Case Western had one of the first uh, 
MD, PhD program is funded by NIH. So I did that for seven years. And uh, things worked out quite well. I'm going to try to tell you the whole story. But when I finished medical school, uh, family practice residency programs were just starting. And I didn't know a lot about them, but I figured, I, you know, that uh, maybe I should go to a residency program that was better established uh, at first. So um, I applied to a lot of programs, and I had done well in medical school, so I, I, I was accepted to this part. I was ranked very high, I should say, in just about all of them, including Marset, I guess, which was the highest ranked one. Then, But I was applying to internal medicine, and but because of my interest in family medicine, I wanted to be able to do pediatric. So I finally ended up going to Rochester on the mixed medicine pediatric program. Gotcha. Uh, and spent uh, two years there. And and because of my PhD and other things, the Macy Foundation uh, gave me a faculty fellowship to go out to what? But it was starting the Martin Luther King Junior Hospital, and I had worked with Dr. King in Atlanta. So I wanted to be a part of that. So I did go out there as a community medicine fellow. And then I finished the family practice residency program at UCLA. They gave me credit for the internal medicine and pediatrics that I had at, uh, at um, Rochester. So that's sort of how I got into it. I, I think to make a long story short, um, I uh, you might say I've been sidetracked a lot in my career because um, my uh, my commitment has related to health equity. And so um, whenever I have felt that I could do something like going out to watch to help develop Martin Luther King Jr. Hospital, uh, I would I would take that opportunity. And then it became a leadership thing where people started recommending me for leadership roles and ended up president of Meharry Medical College. Meharry at that time had graduated over half of the black physicians in the country and it was about to close according to the New York Times. So I was surprised when they called me to ask me the interview and I said, no, I'm not interested. Then people whom I had worked with started calling me and saying, you know, just out of respect, you could go and interview. So uh, I did. I, by that time, I had already started the family practice residency program at King Drew. Um, I developed that program uh, working with Dr. Ludlow Creary. I don't know if you know that name. But uh, Dr. Creary had practiced family medicine for a long time. He was one of the original people who came, you know, who got into academic family medicine from having been a general practitioner. You know, he got all the credentials, and so together we developed, I thought, a pretty strong residency program in family practice at King Blue. But then, as I said, I left and went to Meharry as president. Uh, I, would, I had a commitment that I was going to always see patients regardless of what I needed. And I almost kept it. But... <laughs> But the time came when, as president of Meharry and really challenging times, I was not able to be a good physician for my patients, to be there for them when they needed me. I had to travel. I had to raise money. And so I sort of gave up on that. Um, got quite involved uh, uh, in community and research and ended up, after 12 years at Meharry, being asked to serve as director of the CDC. Um, you know, I, I always told people of all the things I've done in my career, I think the thing that I've enjoyed most is taking care of patients while wow. uh, being a family physician. But it's not always what you enjoy that you get called to do. And so I have sort of tried to follow the calling. Uh, and as you know, that me to the Office of Surgeon General. Um, which I enjoyed. I sort of felt like the family doctor for the nation uh, and took advantage of that position to release the first ever Surgeon General's report on mental health and to really start the movement to integrate mental health and primary care, which we are exemplifying here now at 
Morehouse School of Medicine, where we have one of the strongest integrated mental health primary care programs, working with 11 community health centers. So I'll stop there. And I'll, but Dr. Thatcher, thank lot you. More. My story is long. <laughs> this <laughs> is wonderful. Chris, if, if I might ask, from your uh, perspective, what are the achievements in family medicine of which you're most proud? Well, um, number one, I think um, developing it into an academic discipline, I, I remember when it was not where there were physicians like Dr. Jackson who um, who were general practitioners with varying, varying levels of uh, training beyond medical school, and many of them did great jobs. I think uh, the development of family practice into an academic discipline is one of the greatest achievements. I've served on the board of the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine for several years. I don't remember how many now, but it was several as I moved into various uh, positions. Um, so I think bringing uh, family medicine to the academic health centers, medical schools, and making that a part of students' experience, I still am not completely satisfied with the extent to which it's a part. But um, we've come a long way since today, those days when I finished medical school. And, uh, Rochester actually had a pretty good family practice residency program. But I didn't. Uh, Gene Farley, I mean, you may know that name, one of the original family practice residency director. He and his wife were both physicians, but Gene Farley started the family practice residency program in Rochester. And I, I've often thought that I could have just gone into that program as opposed to taking the long way that I took. Um, but um, I'm, I'm very proud uh, of that. I hope, however, that the role of family medicine in medical education will continue to grow. We've tried to, to really exemplify that at Morehouse. And as you know, we three years ago, we got the award for social mission because of the percentage of our graduates who go into primary care versus family medicine. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm, I'm proud of that. And even I've always felt, of course, that uh, there should be more research. Uh, but I feel research is an, an organized strategy for answering important questions in medicine. And so I think um, there has not been enough research in family practice. Um, but I, that's beginning to change, too. Uh, it's, uh, NIH has even started funding uh, primary care related research, especially they're funding us for the integrated integration of mental health and primary care and some other things. So, but I'm most proud, I guess, of the fact that family physicians take very seriously their responsibility to their patients and, um, and, and try to bring the A game to that relationship. You know, every day, that some probably that commitment to patients and their families. As you think back to you know you're rising through medical school and you're rising through the years towards, and you see this profession um, that was just kind of burgeoning, if you will. What were, as you think back, the things that drew you to that that field, being that it was so new, and what? Um, what do you think some of the dreams for the earliest folks that were starting it up were at that time? Well, I think I always felt that I wanted to be the kind of physician who took care of people uh, regardless of their age or gender. And I, I wanted to, uh, to be a physician who could practice in a place like Anniston, Alabama, where I once said that I was going back to practice. But even though I didn't do that, I always felt it was important for physicians to be able to go to underserved communities, rural communities, and provide uh, comprehensive care to their patients and families. Uh, and we push that now at the Morehouse School of Medicine because many of our graduates go to practice in underserved communities. So I think what really drove me was this commitment to um, 
to uh, to the care of individuals and families uh, in a broad spectrum of um, a need where you're not going to be surrounded by specialists in various fields. Um, but, you know, I've, I've seen everything from Anniston, Alabama, with Dr. Jackson being one of the few and the only one available to, to, to treat uh, black patients in their homes for a while. I've seen that, but I've also seen, um, you know, Hollywood, uh, L.A., where I think there were 300 and something psychiatrists in Beverly Hills alone. So I've seen it. I've seen the broad spectrum of physicians practicing in various communities. Sometimes, you know, they are running over each other. There are so many of them. But I've also seen far too many communities where that there was no access to care. And getting physicians to the point that they're comfortable going to practice where they're most needed is something that I think uh, family practice has done uh, well, despite the growing challenges related to technology. So one of the things I heard you say just now was, that was access, and that's one of the, the um the common themes that has come up when we've talked about some of the, the reasons behind family medicine's initial push and, and creating as a profession. One of the other things that I've, I've heard pretty frequently by many of the founders we've talked to is that there's a feeling that there's kind of an undercurrent or a counterculture movement against traditional medicine or the institution of medicine. Did you have any sense of that, or is that something that you felt um, thinking back? The, say that again, that there was a on the current movement like against a, a bit of a, a countercultural movement to the institution or traditional um, medicine in a way. Or well, that it I mean, goes I, out of pardon me. You you're saying that you heard that that's how family medicine Well I think that's been one of the about. themes uh the, one of the themes that a lot of the the founders have kind of articulated was that there was a sense that there may have been a, a bit of a countercultural revolution in America, and then that started to play itself out a little bit in terms of the dreams of the early founders of family medicine that influenced them, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, I have to say I was not that familiar with that counterculture because I, when I was in the practice of medicine, but usually in communities where, you know, just just the getting access. The people in Watts had to catch three buses to get to the L.A. County Clinic um, and then wait eight to nine hours to be seen. Wow. So, you know, I've, to the extent I've been involved in practical medicine, it's been in situations like that, or even the Meharry situation, where, as a rule, they took care of underserved populations. And that was almost what, what drove the institution to close, because uh, people don't pay you for doing that. Uh, I, I think there are more people insured now, perhaps, than ever before. But for many years, Meharry took care of poor patients without getting reimbursed. And, of course, that the effort that I've led led to the merger of Meharry uh, Medical School and, and the Nashville City Hospital. In, in an alliance between Harry and Vanderbilt, they're serving both institutions quite well. But for most of its history, um, Harry was always hanging on the edge in terms of his financial situation and taking care of patients who had very little means to pay. Um, so uh, I, I guess I missed that counterculture movement against medicine because I've always, I've never questioned. Uh, the value of traditional medicine. I've questioned a system that did not make it available to so many people. It excluded so many people just by the very nature of it, of its funding. And I appreciate that. I think that, I mean, that's, that is helpful, and especially in the context in which you were engaged uh, in, in kind of the, the communities in your training, especially. Um, yeah. We, we had touched briefly, and I know you'd, you'd started to talk about some successes and th the thought that perhaps research was was an area that is maybe still a work to be done. Um, do you, if you think back on the last 40 years of family medicine, can you think of any other areas that may not have turned out quite as well as 
perhaps uh, the early founders would have thought or haven't quite worked out as well? Well, yeah, I think uh, the early founders envisioned a greater role for family medicine in medical education and in in the medical school environment. I, I think the early founders envisioned uh, family physicians uh, gaining in prominence in medical education and playing a, a far greater role. And and that has been hampered, I think, by the very nature of medical education and, and health care in this country, where we, we reward people for for being specialists. We reward people, you know, who who train to take care of you know, one small thing not to take care of the whole patient and certainly not the family. So I think the disappointment would be that it would be with the health system that we have not changed to the point that uh, the system has valued family medicine the way I think uh, we envisioned that it would. That's There's a struggle now to change that still, so that struggle still goes on. Uh, and the Affordable Care Act, of course, provides incentives uh, for primary care providers. It, it, it's been a major federal effort to say that we want to provide incentives for people to to practice family medicine and to be rewarded appropriately. But I don't have to tell you that when it comes to getting rewarded for what you do, uh, family medicine ha- has not been adequately rewarded, and that turns a lot of students away, not just the fact that in medical school they don't see a lot of family physicians, which sends a message to them, but also uh, when they do see physicians, they see the ones who are being rewarded being those who have chosen a small area to specialize in or subspecialize in and to focus on that. So. I would say that's probably the biggest disappointment that we haven't come that far from the way we value health care. And again, even though I know there's been a lot of politics surrounding uh, the Affordable Care Act, even the fact that people call it Obamacare, but I think when you read it, it, the intent in great part was to really incentivize, uh, you know, quality of care. Uh, and especially primary care and prevention. It was a major effort to to incentivize those. Those things have sort of gotten lost with all of the back and forth about it and legal challenges. So, but I, hopefully that's where we're going to end up. We're going to end up really uh, valuing what family physicians do uh, and more and more rewarding them in such a way that Students, uh, many of them who go to medical school, interested in practicing that kind of medicine, family medicine, will not be dissuaded, you know, as they go through the process of medical education and interacting with people in practice. So, Dr. Satcher, uh, a question for you about leadership. So, there's a lot of young uh, family medicine residents and family physicians who sometimes uh, hesitate uh, when thinking about themselves as leaders. And I'm wondering if you can comment to them uh, based on your leadership experience. What what would you recommend to them, and, and what about family physicians as leaders? Well, I'm, I'm sure you know one thing I've done for the last 10 years is to develop and run the Satcher Health Leadership Institute. Um, when I came out of government and came to Morehouse to develop the National Center for Primary Care, one thing I was really adamant about was that I didn't want to be president because Lou Sullivan was ready to step down and he had asked me. And I said no, but then when they came back to me and asked if I would be willing to develop the National Center for Primary Care, I I said yes. In two years, uh, the institution ran into a crisis and basically the faculty members came to me and said, if I didn't take over, many of them were going to leave. Uh, so I agreed to serve as on the interim as president of Morehouse School of Medicine. And they were, it turned out to be two years, and they turned out to be very, 
productive years in terms of, of you know, of academic programs, research, patient, you know, fundraising. So by the time we recruited a new president, the board voted to establish the Satcher Health Leadership Institute. Uh, I, one thing I had done as president was to start a monthly colloquium, I guess you'd call it, in which all of the leaders at Morehouse, the department chairs and vice presidents and all, would get together and talk about leadership. And, you know, we read, read all the great books on leadership and discussed it. So um, the board felt that it would be great if I could continue to focus attention. So over the last 10 years, I've been running this uh, Health Leadership Institute. And it's gone well. It's, um, it has almost $12 million in endowment uh, now. Uh, and um, we have three leadership development programs. We have one for uh, physicians or other, you know, people with terminal degrees uh, like uh, public health docs and psychologists. And that's a 10-month program uh, studying health policy and leadership. And I do a lot of lecturing to that. And I'm in the process now of writing a book uh, entitled Leadership and the Quest for Health Equity. So it's something I've thought a lot about over oh, you know, the last several years. I think leadership is critical. It, it so often makes the difference. And, and I agree with the Institute of Medicine in the 1988 report when they said that leadership is, is too important and too urgent for us to leave the development of leaders to chance alone, that we needed to begin to support, you know, young people to develop leadership skills. I certainly believe that. And in addition to our health policy fellowship, we have a community health leadership program, and that program is for community leaders who may not be in the health field but who would like to do a better job in the community in, in things that would improve health. So we have about 50 community leaders a year because CDC now funds us to bring people from outside of the state of Georgia. And we've had at least 350 graduates, including 10 mayors, and about 50 city councilmen and community people. And they study how policy makes a difference in terms of the health of people and how, you know, um, policy change can sometimes be the greatest factor. So that's that's been a very interesting program. And now uh, it's being expanded where I think we're going to be working with some cities, you know, where they may have a whole group of people studying how do you improve the health of your community and, you know, how do you interact with medicine. So that, and the last program, which everybody says is my favorite, um, is the Quality Parenting Program where we take about 100 parents from the community a year to study uh, child development from zero to five and what parents can do starting with pregnancy to enhance the health of the child, the, the early communication, the nutrition, the avoiding toxins, all of those things. Um, NIH has now funded us to replicate that program in 12 states. So, But to answer your question, because I probably haven't answered it, is um, I, I think there are some principles of leadership that are, are, are worth adhering to. Now, the first thing is, you know, our motto is that um, in order to achieve health equity, we need leaders who first care enough. But we also need leaders who know enough, leaders who have the courage to do enough, and leaders who will persevere until a job is done. That's sort of our motto. And uh, so we try to we try to help young people develop an understanding of policy and how it relates to what happens in communities and what happens in the doctor-patient relationships and how policy can enhance those things. Uh, but we also just teach basic things about the fact that leadership is a team sport and the, and, and you you've got to develop the leadership team if you're going to be successful. Uh, you've got to you've got to communicate clearly, you know where you're trying to go as an institution and get people to get on board with that. Um, 
we have a whole set of leadership lessons that we try to teach and that I'm trying to cover in the, in the book. But it starts with, I think if people are going to be leaders, they ought to start because they have something that they care about. Uh, they have a they have a commitment. Uh, for me, of course, it was health equity and related in great part to the fact that I almost died at the age of two and saw a lot of children die. But um, so my, I, I start from the standpoint of a commitment to health equity globally, really, because I've now often been called upon to work in the global arena with WHO. So I think um, getting people to think about leadership and themselves as leaders starts by asking them, what is it that you really care about enough to lead? I mean, leadership is not always fun. So if you're going to be a leader, you you need to have something that you really care about and not just a position. You know, leadership is not just about positions. It's about a movement. It's moving people in, in a direction, working with people to move in a direction, to achieve certain clear goals and, and objectives. So, uh, Dr. Satcher, I'd like to ask one more question, if I may. Um, I believe when we talked uh, very quickly when I initially asked if you would be willing to be, do this interview, you mentioned that you had a, uh, a personal relationship with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Could you comment on that? Yeah, uh, and that may be stretching a little bit because I'm sure there are a lot of people who say they had a personal relationship <laughs> with great people like Dr. King. But I'll just tell you what it was. Uh, when I was, um, of course, Martin, uh, Martin Luther King was first first came to fame when he was pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. And as you know, I grew up in Alabama. My brother Bob was a student at Alabama State uh, when the Montgomery bus boycott was going on, and he, he was involved in you know walking to work and all that. So when I got to Atlanta and to Morehouse. Um, shortly after that, Martin Luther King moved from Montgomery to Atlanta to develop the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, but he also became co-pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church with his father, whom we called Daddy King. A group of friends and I would walk from the Morehouse campus to Ebenezer whenever we knew that Martin Luther King Jr. was going to be in town and was going to preach. That was five miles each way. And we we you know, we walk, and so we just we used to sit on the edge of our seats when he spoke. And I tell people now when they ask me what was so special about Martin Luther King you know, speaking, I say, well, I've never met anybody who could educate, motivate, and mobilize people as well as Martin Luther King Jr. did. And if you listen to him speak, uh, you know, you are, you were likely to end up joining the movement, including going to jail. And which I did, um, and so um, it's probably stretching a little bit to say that our relationship was personal, because I'm sure a lot of students would would say that. But certainly, I was a part of the movement. Now I knew his brother A.D. better because um, we did some things very closely together. So in terms of personal, I don't know how many people had a personal relationship with Martin Luther King Jr. But because one of my heroes is Andy Young. Um, who teaches in my leadership course, by the way. And wow. he was um, one of Dr. King's uh, right-hand persons. He's in his late 80s, but still teaches. He comes and speaks to the fellows because he's been a mayor. He's been an ambassador. And he was, in fact, a close friend of Dr. King's. So as we finish here, we want to be respectful of your time. Is there anything that you want to say to the young family physicians um, who are just beginning their journey, any special message that you'd like to uh, a challenge or a message you'd like to share with them? Well, uh, I probably would go back to that motto that I gave earlier because I believe in it. I believe that it's important to, to find something that you really care about and, and to care about it enough that you're willing to go to distance and working toward it. So find something you care about and then make sure that you develop the knowledge and skills that you're going to need 
uh, to impact that thing, uh, to take um, learning seriously so that you will know enough to make a difference. But not to be afraid to take risks because I think uh, to make a difference, you, you, you often have to take risks. You know, it's the, the road is not paved. The road to where many of us want to go or want to see things go in medicine is not well paved but we know that there are changes that need to be made. And I would I would say it's important to persevere because, you know, there are going to be times when you're tempted to give up. I know I've been in those times in my life. Uh, but it's amazing how, uh, you know, things work out and sometimes just being able to hang on and wake up in the morning makes all the difference in the world when things look quite different than they did last night. There are those times, I think, in all of our lives. But uh, so I, w- I would uh, counsel them to find something they care about and and pursue it, but to stay the course, I mean, not to, not to be dissuaded by opposition or by fears of dis- things are going to happen that can discourage you. But sometimes just being able to stay the course is enough to to make a difference. Thank you, Dr. Satcher. And and I'd I'd also like to say thank you for what you've done for for medicine, for the specialty of family medicine. Uh, Your leadership has inspired others, and your work has um, had a tremendous impact and continues to have a tremendous impact. We really appreciate on behalf of what you've done for the country, um, really appreciate your contribution. Well, it's oh. very kind of you. Thanks very much. Uh, I know we still well, have a lot to do, and I appreciate what you're doing. I, I, I would echo that in just saying briefly that I, when you said um, your proudest days are the, those that you got a chance to be a family physician uh, and mm-hmm. see patients face-to-face, uh, that, that gave me goosebumps just about everywhere. Um, and as I'm slugging through the trenches and seeing patients day by day and finding joy and finding um, hard, uh, hard battles and, and everything else, I, I certainly think those, those words will ring true with me. I, I don't think I'll ever forget hearing you say that. So thank you. You know, don't take it for granted. Uh, it's quite a privilege to be able to, to take care of patients and, and to share some of their deepest secrets and wounds and, and have them trust you. Uh, to make the difference that needs to be made in their life and help. Don't take that for granted. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, good luck to you all. Appreciate what you're Thank doing. You. Thank uh, you, Dr. Time and for your service. Thank okay. you very much.